Hello everybody, this is Beth Grigg, the Director of Windermere Residential Health Services. I'd like to welcome you to this Windermere Wellness Program about men's health. Sit back and relax, and hopefully you will learn some helpful information. Before we dig into our topics, I thought it'd be a good idea just to become familiar with the anatomy of the male body. Um, in particular, we're going to be talking during this presentation a lot about the bladder, and about the prostate. Um, so take a look at the diagram and see if you can locate those two items. The bladder is a hollow organ in the lower abdomen. It stores urine, which is the liquid waste produced by the kidneys. As the bladder fills with urine, pressure is exerted on its walls. Um, and that's when your body is telling you that you have the need to urinate. This triggers the brain to send a message to the outer layer of muscle that surrounds the inner lining of the bladder. This forces the muscle to contract and the urine to flow out of the bladder. At the same time, the sphincter muscles that surrounds the urethra, which is the tube um, leading the urine out of the body, uh, relaxes and it lets the urine flow out of the body. This process requires both nerves and muscles working together to prevent urine leakage. The prostate is a small gland in men that helps to make semen. It's located just below the bladder in front of the rectum, and it wraps around the tube that carries the urine and semen out of the body. Um, it looks like a donut. It tends to grow larger as you get older, and if the prostate gets too large, it can cause some health issues that we'll be talking about. Some of you might be familiar with the term benign prostatic hyperplasia, otherwise known as BPH. It's a very common situation with older men. It means that your prostate is enlarged, but it's not cancerous. So there are different types of treatment for benign prostate hyperplasia, including watchful waiting, also called active surveillance. Your doctor may tell you just to wait to see if the problems get worse before starting treatment. Or you can have medications uh, to help shrink the prostate or relax muscles near the prostate to ease symptoms. Or if nothing else has worked, your doctor might suggest surgery or other um, treatments to help the urine flow. Sometimes radio waves, microwaves, or lasers are used to treat the urinary problems caused by BPH. What are the symptoms and signs of BPH? Weak urine stream, frequent urination, dribbling after urination, the urge to urinate suddenly, leakage of urine, also called overflow incontinence, or frequent urination during the night. One of the tests that can be done to determine if you have an enlarged prostate is to do a blood test called a PSA. Until recently, many doctors encouraged yearly PSA testing for all men beginning at age 50 or even earlier for men at a high risk of prostate cancer. As doctors have learned more about the benefits and harms of prostate cancer screening, they have begun to caution against annual PSA testing. Talk with your doctor to see what's best for you. Yearly PSA testing in men without symptoms is generally not recommended. However, in men who report symptoms, PSA testing can help the doctors determine the nature of the problem. Um, there are other things besides an enlarged prostate that can cause an elevated PSA, as you will see on the screen. Um, prostatitis, which we'll be talking about in a few minutes, prostate cancer, recent ejaculation, a digital rectal exam, or even something as, as benign as bicycle riding can cause an elevated PSA. If you go to talk to your doctor about problems relating to your prostate, usually what the plan is, is they'll start with the least invas invasive treatments first and work their way down until uh, you get into some of the more invasive treatments. So medications are usually started first to see if that will help. Um, there are other treatments that can be done in a doctor's office, like the Eurolift system, or thermal therapies where they use um, blasts of um, high pressured water or steam to get rid of some extra um, tissue from the prostate. They can use lasers um, and then they can also do more invasive surgery. As you can tell by this diagram, um, 
it shows what they're trying to accomplish with some of the treatments uh, to shrink the tissue of the prostate. So the picture on the left shows how much the prostate is squeezing into the urethra. And again, as a reminder, the urethra is the tube that brings the urine out of the bladder, um, outside of the body. When the prostate, that donut organ, it wraps around the urethra, uh, it keeps the urine from being able to come out easily. And that's where some of the urinary symptoms can come from. So with some of these treatment plans, the idea is to shrink that tissue of the prostate so the urine can flow more easily. And you can see with the picture on the right, that's what the intended result is after the treatments. There are some other situations that can happen with your bladder that can cause you symptoms. Um, there's something called prostatitis, and which is basically an inflammation of the prostate. There's some different reasons why this might happen. There's acute bacterial prostatitis. This usually starts suddenly from a bacterial infection. See your doctor right away if you have fever, chills, or pain in addition to the prostate symptoms that we discussed before. Most cases can be cured with antibiotics, but you might also need some medication to help with pain or discomfort. There's also chronic bacterial prostatitis, which is an infection that comes back again and again. This is much more rare. It can be hard to treat. Sometimes taking antibiotics for a long time can work. You'll need to talk to your doctor about the plans that will help you feel better. There's also something called chronic pelvic pain syndrome or chronic prostatitis. It's a common prostate problem. It can cause pain in the lower back, in the groin, or at the tip of the penis. And treatment may require a combination of medicine, surgery, and lifestyle changes. Symptoms of prostate cancer can be similar to symptoms of an enlarged prostate, but there are some differences. You do want to see your doctor right away if you have any of the following symptoms. If you notice blood in your urine or semen, if you have trouble urinating, if you have discomfort in your pelvic area, if you're having painful sensations during urination or a difficult time passing urine, or if you are having uh, difficulties with impotence, those are times to give your doctor a call. To find out if prostate symptoms are caused by cancer, your doctor will ask you about past medical problems and your family's medical history. Your doctor will also perform a physical exam. During the exam, your doctor will put a gloved finger into your rectum to examine your prostate to check for the size and firmness and texture of the prostate, any hard areas, lumps, or growth spreading beyond the prostate, any pain caused by touching or pressing on the prostate. You may be asked to give a urine sample for testing. Your doctor may also do a blood test that we talked about already to test the PSA levels. If your tests show that you might have cancer, your doctor will refer you to a specialist for a prostate biopsy. The pro doctor will take a small tissue sample from several areas in the prostate to look for cancer cells. Treating prostate cancer. Treatment for prostate cancer depends on whether cancer is in part of or all of the prostate or if it has spread to other parts of the body. It also depends on your age and overall health. Talk with your doctor about the best treatment choices for you and the possible side effects of the treatment. You may also want to ask another doctor for a second opinion. Some of the treatments for prostate cancer could be watchful waiting, if the cancer is not causing problems, you may decide not to get treated right away. Instead, your doctor will check regularly for changes in your condition. Treatment will start if the cancer starts to grow. Another treatment option could be surgery. The most common type of surgery removes the whole prostate and some nearby tissue. They might consider radiation therapy. This treatment uses radiation to kill cancer cells and shrink tumors. The radiation may come from an x-ray machine or from tiny radioactive pellets placed inside or near the tumor. Or they might consider hormone therapy. Men having other treatments like radiation therapy also may be treated with drugs to stop the body from making testosterone. 
This is done if it seems likely that the cancer will come back. Hormone therapy also can be used for prostate cancer that is spread beyond the prostate. If you'd like more information about prostate issues specifically related to cancer, there are some great resources available. The National Cancer Institute, uh, with the phone number listed there, is a good place to start. Um, and there's also the website, cancer.gov backslash prostate. Or you can look at the information from the National Urologic Disease uh, Information Clearinghouse. Their phone number is there, as well as their website. We're going to move on now and talk a little bit about erectile dysfunction. Um, so I know this picture is funny and, and people tend to find some humor in erectile dysfunction, but um, if you're going through the, these problems um, yourself, you might feel alone and you might feel isolated, um, but you are not alone. Approximately uh, 30 million men are affected by erectile dysfunction, or we'll just call it ED to make it easier to talk about. ED is the inability to maintain or develop an erection sufficient for sexual intercourse. There are various degrees of severity, ranging from total inability to have an erection to a tendency to only maintain brief erections. The condition can be distressing, but it's important to remember that it can be overcome. There are different causes for erectile dysfunction, and it'll be very important for you to be open with your doctor and talk about what symptoms you're having, what problems you're having, so they can help determine what the physical cause could be and to look for ways to reduce the problem. The majority of men experiencing ED can trace its origin to a physical problem or disorder. For most men, the cause can be easily identified and with the proper treatment, a satisfying sex life can easily be resumed. So some of the physical ca causes for ED could include medication side effects, smoking, drinking, heart disease, diabetes, surgeries. Um, there also are some psychological causes such as stress, depression, or a poor relationship. When you're looking at treatment options for erectile dysfunction, um, your doctor might help you with some suggestions. Uh, there are some um, tech treatments and some surgery options and implants that can be considered. A penile implant is a device that is placed in your body and is designed to help you get and maintain an erection. Following the routine outpatient procedure, a four to eight week recovery period is necessary before you can use the implant. So your doctor will tell you specifically about the recovery process and the benefits of each type um, when you go to talk to him or her. Medications are also something that can be used. Here are a few silly cartoons about a very commonly known medication called Viagra which tends to work for some fellas with erectile dysfunction. So it's important to talk to your doctor and see if medication such as this would be helpful for you. If you are dealing with ED, you might find that you have a difficult time communicating what's going on with your partner. And you might also be having some psychological repercussions from ED. A man with ED will often experience deep feelings of shame, loneliness, anxiety, and depression. He can often say that the inability to have an erection makes him feel like less of a man. He may be afraid to kiss or cuddle his partner and may be afraid to have an open discussion about what's been going on with his body. But I encourage you to take time to talk with your partner, have some conversation, put some time and space between your conversation, make sure that your partner is aware of the fact that you're addressing the situation what potential health conditions could be a trigger for your ED, and encourage them to come along with you to your appointment if you feel comfortable with that. Or you can invite them to have a private conversation with your physician as well. It's up to you and your partner to decide what your level of comfort is. We're going to talk now about a third topic, our last main topic of the, of the presentation, and that's about um, men's incontinence. We call it the unspoken subject. There's not as much information out there for men 
um, in terms of incontinence management and treatments and support compared to women. As you can see on this chart, women um, are a lot more likely to have uh, incontinence of urine than men. But as you can also see, as men get older, the incidence of, of being incontinent um, can rise and pretty dramatically. It's not, however, simply a function of aging. It's directly related to other illnesses, such as an enlarged prostate, prostate cancer, certain neurological conditions like MS, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's. To a lesser extent, the incidence of diabetes and being overweight, as well as other risk factors, can increase the incidence of urinary incontinence in men. It's important to determine the type of urinary incontinence that you have, and your symptoms often tell your doctor which type you do have. That information will guide the treatment options. Your doctor is likely to start with a thorough history and physical. You then may be asked to do a simple maneuver that can demonstrate incontinence, such as coughing. After that, your doctor will likely recommend a urine test to check for signs of infection, traces of blood or other abnormalities. They might recommend that you start a bladder diary that we'll talk about in a second. Uh, they might want to do a post void residual measurement. What happens with this is you're asked to urinate into a container that measures urine output. Then your doctor checks the amount of leftover urine in your bladder using a catheter or an ultrasound test. A large amount of leftover urine in your bladder may mean that you have an obstruction in your urinary tract or a problem with your bladder nerves or muscles. If further information is needed, your doctor may recommend some more involved tests such as urodynamic testing and pelvic ultrasound. And these tests are usually done um, if you're considering surgery as well. It's very important to be open and honest with your doctor about what issues you're dealing with when it comes to incontinence. What I recommend is to consider these questions, write down your answers, and bring them with you the next time you go talk to your doctor. It's going to be very helpful for your doctor to have this information. It gives them valuable insight as to what's going on with you. And, and because of this, they'll be able to help you um, with the best treatment plan possible. So some of the questions that I'd really encourage you to, to write down the answers to are, do you experience strong urges to empty your bladder? In an eight hour period, how often do you have the urge to empty your bladder? Do you have difficulty reaching the restroom in time to prevent leakage? How often do you have leakage before reaching the restroom? When you have leakage, does it just dampen your undergarments or does it require a change of clothes? Do you routinely wear a pad as protection from leakage? How many times a night do you get up to empty your bladder? Do you always wake up in time to prevent leakage? Do you experience leakage when you laugh, cough, bend, or stand up from a seated position? Do you have leakage when exercising? Do you have a strong urge to empty your bladder before the leakage occurs? Do you have frequent urges to empty your bladder? Do you feel that you completely empty your bladder? Do you experience dribbling after you have emptied your bladder? Your doctor might recommend that you keep something called a bladder diary. Uh, for several days, you record how much you drink, when you urinate, the amount of urine you produce, whether you had an urge to urinate, and the number of times that you had incontinence. You can see this example up on your screen. Um, this one's a pretty detailed one that wants you to write down what kind of fluids, what kinds of foods, how much of each. Um, you don't have to get this detailed, but you certainly can if you want to. And this information is going to be very helpful for you and your doctor to determine a uh, plan of action and what specifically is going on with your body. And if you need a template for a bladder diary or you need assistance in finding one, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'd be happy to help you. There are some different tech subjects now, tech, tech, technological opportunities to help with um, bladder diaries. Um, and to uh, manage um, incontinence issues. So one of them, um, the picture on the right, shows an app 
that you can put on your smartphone if you use one. And it's your bladder diary that makes it very easy to keep track of what's going on with your body. So as you can see on this screen, you would click whether you're having a leak, how much of the leak is happening, if you're having an urge, and how severe the urge is, and if you're doing anything specific that could be triggering the leak. Um, then in keeping the information in this way, it's a very easy way to track it. Then it's also very easy to share that information with your doctor. Um, the picture on the left is a, a vibrating watch. What happens with this it might be helpful is if part of your problem with incontinence is caused by just not being able to feel the need to urinate. If you've had a neurological problem that um, makes it hard for you to feel the urge to urinate. If you set your watch to go off every few hours, that'll be your trigger to remind yourself to go into the to the bathroom and to try to urinate. And some gentlemen find this to be a very helpful kind of product to use. Your doctor might talk with you also about some surgical types of options. There's something that's called a virtue mail sling. And this can be used for stress incontinence. Material is wrapped around the urethra to compress it and to prevent leaking due to coughing, sneezing, or vigorous activities. And of course, this would be something that you would talk over with your physician. Two other types of more invasive treatments that can be done for urinary incontinence. Um, there's one that's an implanted electrical stimulator that's used um, to help uh, stimulate the bladder to work more effectively. And the other one is an implanted artificial sphincter that can be used. Um, it uses a cuff to close the urethra. And squeezing the pump open, oh, squeezing the pump opens the cuff and it releases the urine when you're ready to uh, use the bathroom. So of course, both of those things also would be um, discussed with your physician to see if they would be a benefit to you. Your physician may recommend that you do some exercises called Kegel exercises and that you do them frequently to, to strengthen the muscles that help control urination. These exercises are especially effective for stress incontinence, but may also help urge incontinence when you suddenly have to go to the bathroom and have a hard time holding it. As you can see in the picture, the before picture, that red area, those are the, the bladder control muscles, and you can see how underdeveloped they are, and they're not doing a very good job keeping that um, urethra closed. Um, but on the picture on the right shows what those bladder control muscles look like after you've done some of these Kegel exercises. They're stronger, they do a better job of closing up that urethra so, um, so the urine doesn't leak out. So how do you do these exercises? Imagine that you're trying to stop your urine flow and then tighten and contract the muscles that you would use to stop urinating and hold for five seconds and then relax for five seconds. If this is too difficult, start by holding for two seconds and then relaxing for three seconds. You wanna work up to holding the contractions for 10 seconds at a time and aim to do at least three sets of 10 repetitions every day. If you're having a hard time identifying and correcting the right muscle, your doctor may recommend that you work with a physical therapist or there are also other ways to help uh, figure out these muscles by using biofeedback techniques. So be sure to be open with your physician if you're having a hard time understanding how to do Kegels. There's some devices now that can assist with uh, doing Kegel exercises um, from a stimulator point of view. Um, I am showing one here in the picture. The D-Free system is something that can be purchased on Amazon um, or in other uh, medical supply companies. Um, you insert the end of the device into your rectum and what it does, it stimulates and strengthens your pelvic floor muscles through gentle electrical stimulation. Um, the negative part about this is you may need multiple treatments over several months um, some gentlemen find great benefit from it and others do not. When you're dealing with incontinence, you need to take a look at your lifestyle and make some changes that would make your life a little bit easier. I have the picture up there about be prepared. It's not just for scouts. 
Urinary incontinence can strike at inconvenient times. So why not always be prepared, map your route, decide on spots where their bathroom breaks, where you're going, wear clothing that's easy to remove in a hurry. And it's always a good idea to have extra pads, plastic urinal in the car if you're going somewhere, if you're going on a long trip, um, just to make sure that you're prepared and you have what you need. The other thing that's important to do is to make sure that you're drinking fluid, that you're keeping your body healthy. Uh, you want to avoid urinary tract infections, which can, which can increase problems related to incontinence. So make sure that you are drinking water, um, other beverages like, you know, the cartoon talks about whiskey. Um, sometimes those can be actually more irritating to the bladder and can cause heightened problems with incontinence. So it's best if possible to just stick with, with water as much as you can. Uh, constipation can also cause problems with incontinence. This lovely picture um, shows what happens if you have a lot of stool in your rectum. If somebody is very constipated, you see how that stool is starting to push into the bladder. So that means the bladder doesn't have as much space to hold urine um, and the stool is just kind of forcing some of the urine out. So do what you can to avoid constipation. If you need any tips on constipation prevention, come on down and see one of your residential health nurses. We're happy to talk you through that. Some gentlemen find that even with the treatment options, um, they still need a little extra support. So there are some plenty of products that you can consider getting. Um, there are some pads that you wear in your underwear, like the product to the right. The product to the left are some disposable underpants that you can wear. So some people prefer either one. Typically, the disposable underwear tends to be more absorbent, but it's a little bit harder to change. But unlike the big bulky adult diapers you might imagine, today's incontinence pads and undergarments are designed to be comfortable and unnoticeable. There are other types of products that you can get when you're dealing with incontinence. And most of these products can be bought either on Amazon or through a medical supply company. Um, drip collectors, like the one on the right, can be used. They're disposable padded sheets that go around the penis. They're good for slight leaking or dribbling. Um, and what this particular kind does is it also has an extra compression closure, which means that it um, kind of clamps off the urethra in a gentle way so the urine can't easily come out. But if the urine does come out, then the absorbent pouch absorbs whatever, whatever leaks out. There's another product on the left that's a little simpler. It's just a just a regular clamp. Um, and as you can see, it's very padded. The idea is that it's a comfortable thing to wear and it just clamps off the end of the urethra so the urine can't dribble out as easily. Incontinence devices and products like these can also be bought on Amazon or found in medical supply companies. External catheters roll on the penis like condoms and they catch urine. They're attached to drainage bags that can be hung over the side of your bed when you sleep or strapped to the body under your clothes during the day. And as you can see on the left, there are some other products that are basically their underwear with one of these external catheters built right into the underwear to make it more secure, more comfortable, and you might find that these products work very well for you. If overflow incontinence is an issue and your doctor recommends it, uh, you might need to start intermittent catheterization, which means that you would place a tube through your urethra into your bladder at scheduled times to regularly empty it and help prevent leakage. And again, this would be something that you and your doctor would talk over together and it would require um, a prescription for the, some of the supplies and residential health can also help you in getting a, a nursing visit so you would be able to be taught how to do this and to learn how to reduce the risks of infection as you're using a catheter. If you have daytime control over your bladder, but you wake up to use the bathroom several times during the night, you're experiencing something called nocturia. 
While most individuals with nocturia wake up to use the bathroom, missing your body signal is common, resulting in nighttime wetting. If you begin to experience frequent urination at night, make sure that you talk to your doctor about it. This can be a sign of a prostate enlargement. It could be a sign of other types of prostate issues. And it would be important to make sure that they're aware of how many times during the night you need to get up. Um, if nighttime incontinence is a, is a challenge for you, be aware that there are special products to be used at nighttime. There's some extra absorbent briefs and disposable underwear that you can purchase to wear to protect your bedding and to make you more comfortable. There are also pads that you can put on your bed. I would recommend a waterproof mattress cover. Um, and then you'd also want to make sure that you use some creams, uh, barrier creams to protect your skin if you're going to be having um, some urine sitting on your skin during the night. A barrier cream can be found any pharmacy. You can ask the pharmacist for recommendations and they can help you find a good brand. Sometimes people ask, well, how do I get these supplies? How do I find incontinence supplies? Some people say I'm too embarrassed to buy them. What can I do to get them if I'm homebound and I have a hard time you know, going out to the store? Uh, one thing that you can start with is asking your pharmacist. A lot of pharmacies will deliver products to you, especially if you already have an account set up with them for prescription delivery. You can ask them if they can also deliver these incontinence products. If you like going online, Amazon is one of the best places that you can find a wide range of incontinence products and devices. So if you know you need help with that don't hesitate to come down and talk to me about it I'm happy to help you with that at any time there's also a really great program called the National Incontinence Company and they have a phone number as well as a website um, they offer access to a specialist or a nurse practitioner who can talk to you to help you select a product that's right for you so that could be a great benefit to you you might want to take advantage of that service Thank you for attending this meeting. I hope that you enjoyed the information and that you found it valuable. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to come down and talk to me. Remember, you are not alone. You have options. Help is available. My phone number is 630-681-4037. What you say to me is confidential, and I'm happy to help you investigate any of these common men's problems and to help you figure out what treatment plans uh, would be available to you. Thank you again for attending, and I look forward to hearing any comments and questions.